pleasure to be here. I was uh, not hoping or thinking that I would be on this side of the audience, but uh, <laughs> thanks to the organizers, they have put me here, so I uh, try to do my bit. Uh, so I will be giving uh, uh, topics, uh, talks on topics basically related to uh, weakly coupled higher spin theories and uh, more explicitly uh, Chern Simon's theories coupled to matter in two plus one dimensions and uh, especially emphasizing the fact of uh, boson fermion duality in two plus one dimensional field theories. Uh, <coughs> So before I begin my talk, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, uh, I heard from my uh, very close friend and collaborator, Tamiyaki Yonea, uh, today that uh, Professor Keiji Kikawa passed away uh, on the weekend. And uh, uh, many of you may know, many of you may not, that uh, Keiji Kikawa was the person who discovered what we call in string theory T-duality. He was also one of the uh, main authors of the so-called KVS program, Kikawa Sakita Virasoro program in the old dual models, which produced uh, the string perturbation theory in its most primitive form in those days. So I, I thought I'd mention this to you and dedicate this uh, lecture to his memory because I actually was taught mathematical physics by him. Uh, when I was a graduate student. Okay, so, so the topic of discussion is higher spin field theories in uh, two plus one dimensions. And uh, as I said, uh, specifically these are field theories of various types of matter uh, coupled to uh, John Simon's theory. And uh, one of the essential results which I will try to uh, indicate in these lectures will be the fact that the level dank duality of Chern Simon's theory in two plus one dimensions is basically equivalent to Fermi Bose duality. Now <coughs> we choose to study uh, <coughs> higher spin theories in the context of conformal field theory because uh, conformal field theory affords a very uh, good grip on our ability to make very precise statements, which are quite general and independent of the matter content of these theories. So uh, <coughs> let me uh, begin with the talk. Okay. There are two technical ingredients here. One is conformal field theory, and other one is the so-called large n limit because I am interested in higher spin theories which are weakly coupled because for strongly coupled higher spin theories it's a totally different ballgame and perhaps uh, not so fundamental. <coughs> so let's begin with uh, d equal to 3 or uh, <coughs> we are in 2 plus 1 dimension. And the conformal group in this theory is this particular non-compact group. It is uh, generated by translations, rotations, dilatations, and the special conformal transformations. <coughs> and uh, the representations of this uh, conformal group are basically uh, discussed in terms of uh, the uh, subgroup of uh, SO32. This is the so-called little group. And uh, the representations here are labeled in terms of the spin quantum number and uh, over here in terms of a real number called delta which is the dimension, which we will see is the dimension of the various operators, uh, primary states of this uh, theory. So this is the spin, and this is the. Now, of course, uh, there is a lot of literature on this, which I will not uh, really uh, 
discuss with you, but uh, <coughs> some elementary implications of the fact that you are looking at unitary representations are as follows. So, if you look at states or operators with spin greater or equal to 1, then there is a bound here on the dimension. If s is equal to half, then the bound is different. And if s is equal to 0, delta is greater than or equal to half. And uh, in our discussions over here, we will basically be interested in theories in which uh, delta is equal to 2 or 0. Okay. So, all the primary operators of our theory are basically labeled by these two numbers, which uh, satisfy these conditions based on unitarity. Yes. No. So, you say delta equals 2 or 0? Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, now we know that uh, I will just state all these uh, results. I mean, I am not going to prove anything over here that uh, if you look at representations with spin uh, greater or equal to 1, then uh, <coughs> the bound delta equal to s plus 1 is uh, basically uh, uh, saturated by what are called short representations. I will come back to this point a bit later on. Okay. Now, let us discuss uh, higher spin currents in a very elementary simple theory first. That is a free fermion theory with the following Lagrangian. Yes, I will. I will go. Oh, it is a bit low. Oh, okay, okay, certainly. Sorry. So, Okay, and of course, uh, you all know that the equation of motion is just the massless Dirac equation. And uh, this is just as an example. I could have worked with free bosons also, but uh, I will write down the first few currents. So, this is the, of course, the well known charge current. And when I write this, I am basically having in mind. Uh, un theory or a on theory. Most of the time I will be looking at this. And so, these are fermions in the fundamental representation of uh, this group. So, in fact, there is a hidden index here, which is basically sum from 1 to n. Okay. So, I won't be writing these indices, but this is what we are looking at. So, the Second current, of course, is the very fundamental current, which is the energy momentum tensor, <coughs> and it's the following. And more importantly, and this is the one which is pretty non-trivial is the following. Let me just write it down to uh, convince you that all this actually can be really done and constructed over a long period of time and with a lot of work. I will give you the references towards the end of my lectures.
and so on. So in general, you have a psi bar, a gamma matrix, and a whole set of uh, derivatives, all so arranged that these currents actually are all symmetric tensors of uh, SO3, and they are traceless. So, sorry. Okay, but not this equation again. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do that. Okay. So, 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 sorry to be uh, yeah, uh, yeah. blackboard monitor, but so I guess uh, in the spin two current, the derivative is mu two. Is that right? Uh, acting one way and minus. That's right. The other that's way. Right. Yes, uh, that's right. Portion. And in each case, it's completely symmetrized. Exactly. So, so in the fermions or bosons or whichever theory you look at, whichever matter, what you have to form are symmetric traceless sensors, which then transform under the spin s of the SO3. So this is the math problem that you have to do. And uh, there are, uh, Hiroman had worked out very beautifully, algorithm uh, uh, actually to generate all of them, not trivial. Okay. So we have the symmetric traceless tensors and obviously they are all conserved by the equation of motion. I will just be right for all. So, because we are looking at UN theory, we have the uh, highest spin symmetry. There are conserved currents for each positive number s. And we are looking at when in which the fields are real, then only you have even number of spins. And the way to see it basically is that you look at the complex theory and simply project out the uh, fact uh, that uh, psi equals to psi bar, and all the orthos will disappear. Okay, so this is an example of highest spin symmetry of the Dirac theory, and you can do the similar thing for the bosons. We we'll have an identical equation that the uh, divergence of the highest spin currents is equal to zero. Now, by construction, by construction. In all of these cases, delta is actually equal to S plus 1. You can verify this uh, by hand if you like. Uh, or you can actually prove a small little current algebra identity, which I will do uh, in a short while, that indicates that the conservation of these currents is equivalent to setting delta equal to S plus 1. That just follows from the formal invariance of the uh, Euclidean conformal group, which I just mentioned to you. Okay. So, in some sense, if you look at the free field here, uh, these currents, these operators uh, are the primary fields. They carry the representation of the conformal group and they are like the basic oscillators, the basic uh, operators which create the states of this theory, which are labeled by the spin and the dimension given by S plus 1. Okay, so this is the uh, statement about the three fields. Now, as I mentioned to you that uh, this is very module independent. It doesn't require any model to really show this, and I will indicate this to you very quickly because it's a very nice. Uh, so we work with uh, positive norms, and very schematically, I'm going to write like this. So uh, this is basically d mu of uh, j mu with other indices, and this is d mu of j mu with other indices. And uh, I'm going to use a crucial fact that the translation operator uh, in SO41, which is the Euclidean version of SO32, uh, conjugates to the special conformal transformation. That is, T mu dagger is equal to K mu. I possibly can't really go down and explain all this. Uh, I will get very confused because it's a little lengthy, but believe me, it's true. And therefore, you essentially have 
j j <coughs> commutator p mu k mu j symbolically and now i use the fact that there is a commutation relation that uh, gives you uh, something proportional to the dilatation generator delta mu nu plus the angular momentum and uh, if you substitute all this and carry out these calculations you will essentially find that this is equal to delta minus s minus 1 acting on j so as long as the norm of j is uh, non zero and positive uh, it's clear that uh, this equation that delta equal to s minus 1 s plus 1 sorry is the same as the conservation of the higher spin current now i will be using this fact that this is all many times in high energy physics we call this a twist so in these problems the twist is actually one don't ask me why it's called a twist maybe john can answer that question but Okay. Now, this is one fact which is important to keep in mind. So, what we have shown is that uh, if you take free fields, then you have a conserved higher spin symmetry. Yes? I can't hear you. Yes, of course. It both ways too. Both ways, okay. Thank you. So, what I said just now is that uh, we have shown that in free field theory, you have uh, these conservation laws. The question asked by Malder Sena and Ziboydiev was if you have exact higher spin conservation laws, uh, is the theory free or interacting and they proved that the theory is free. So, both ways it is true that uh, if this is exact for all s, then both ways you have free fields. And you will see why, why they arrived at this type of statement. Uh, uh, in, in a short while actually, which is based on some uh, other piece of work uh, in this area. Okay, <coughs> so uh, we are done with free fields, now turn on interactions. Let us go to an interacting field theory and the field theories we have in mind are uh, bosonic matter coupled to gauge fields, fermionic matter coupled to gauge fields, supersymmetric matter coupled to gauge fields of all types of variety and if it is coupled to gauge fields, the gauge fields have a certain action. Uh, since we are in 2 plus 1 dimensions and we are interested in conformal field theory, the only action that you can write down is the churn simons action. The standard Maxwell action is dimensional and so we can simply forget it in the infrared. Though we can use it very crucially, I will come to this, when we try to regularize our theory. Uh, when you do uh, calculations. But let us now go to uh, matter plus gate fields. Okay, various types of matter. Okay, how do you do that? And what is the status of all this? higher spin symmetry when you have a interacting theory and uh, this is of course the main meat of this talk because uh, whatever I have said before is sort of reasonably trivial. So, if you have gauge fields you will simply introduce them by the standard method A mu which is the covariant derivative. And uh, so, you will have a action for matter which is the some matter action plus the John Simons action which 
have normalized in this way. So, it is the trace of A B A plus I 2 upon 3 A Q. And the matter action is of various types. You can have a fermion theory like this, but you can deform the fermion theory in this way. And if you add a quadratic term here, this is the well known gross novo type of model. Or you can have a matter theory which is uh, which is bosonic, right? And uh, it will have a potential, and this potential can have uh, terms like this, <coughs> which are marginal in uh, two plus one dimensions. So you can actually explore, uh, you know, regular bosons, bosons. Uh, which are such that the dimension of the boson in the ultraviolet is uh, is uh, such that uh, phi phi has dimension 1. Or you can also explore the bosonic theory near the Wilson Fisher type of fixed point in which the dimension of this operator is 2. And this is the 2 I was referring to before actually. Okay. And then of course, I mean if you are in particle physics, then uh, you cannot uh, but work with uh, supersymmetric theories. So there are n equal to two supersymmetric actions, very beautiful uh, symmetries. So you have Suzy stuff, all this type of stuff actually, plus John Simons interacting with the gauge field. This is our theory that we want to understand. Okay, now so. Just one comment which is uh, important that most of the time I will be uh, uh, working with uh, the unitary group, so the fields are complex. Uh, however, when I am actually talking about uh, real fields or ON theory, I will mention that and I will come to that a little bit later. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I said that we were interested in weak coupling. Now, how do you do weak coupling theory in gauge theories is by looking at the large n limit such that this goes to 0. u over here, n over here is just the rank of this gauge group u n. But you want to parameterize your theory in a reasonable way. So, you also define uh, this object so that this is a fixed number which you want to dial in your theory. So, this is called the so called a toft limit. It has very uh, beautiful consequences when the gauge fields are really dynamical in the sense that the Feynman diagrams are uh, into one to one correspondence with uh, two dimensional Riemann surfaces, which is a neat result of a toft. But in our model, in two plus one dimensions with fundamental matter, no such great things happen and we are simply dealing with a rather simple type of theory. Okay, so, this is uh, the limit we are interested in weakly coupled gauge theories or weakly coupled theories of higher spin in this limit. All right, that uh, there should be a way of generalizing these equations to this situation when you have an interacting theory. So, the first thing you would do is simply replace all the derivatives by covariant derivatives, right. But uh, of course, uh, it is too naive because whilst derivatives commute, covariant derivatives do not commute. Okay. So, okay, so the first thing to do is basically to replace in that expression, let us take J3 because that is the most representative higher spin you replace uh, d mu by d mu and call it j hat of mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. And there is some formula. I am not going to write it down. But that will not be traceless and symmetric. Okay. So, uh, because, uh, because of this problem that there is curvature actually in the covariant derivative, 
So you've got to work a little bit harder. And you can do that and solve this problem by, by simply defining, I'll write over here, you have a new definition of uh, spin currents. Unfortunately, I have erased this, but mu1, mu2, mu3 is equal to j hat, mu1, mu2, mu3 minus. So, these are explicit classical calculations which you can do pi upon 5k eta use the matrice you have psi bar psi gamma mu 3 psi. Note psi bar psi. The four fermion term. So this is a symmetric traceless tensor with spin s. Okay. Now, what is its dimension? All I'll come to a bit later. It's almost the same as before. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. Hat is the hat object is obtained by taking the early expression and replacing symmetrizing and symmetrizing and then remove the trace. This fellow just subtracted is the trace. That, that's it. And uh, you know. This is just done by using classical equations of motion, and you can show that this is conserved. I'm sorry, not conserved. <laughs> that, that's the most important point. That uh, I'll just write down this formula for you. So you do mu j mu mu one mu two is equal to minus sixteen pi upon k. Okay, <coughs> so it takes uh, some uh, algebra, uh, algebraic skills to arrive at this equation. This is a, it's a fundamental equation of our discussion. It's a classical equation, it makes the point right away. It makes the point that even classically, in the presence of interactions, the spin tree current is not really conserved. The right hand side, in the limit of large k, is a small number. More important, there is not a single term on the right hand side which is proportional to the current itself. So there is no such explicit breaking, and the breaking only happens by double trace operators in this problem. So, I have said many, many very important things which I will tell out as we go that uh, the weak symmetry breaking of higher spin that we are talking about is basically encapsulated in this very elementary equation which you can derive using the classical equations of motion and you will form it up now in the quantum theory all these statements that I made. Okay. okay. I forgot to mention that the J naught is the spin 0 psi bar psi. This is the dimension 2 fellow and uh, uh, dimension 2 in the free field theory. And uh, this is just the this is just the uh, so the the important point I'm trying to make is that the currents are not conserved by effects of order one to n. But we have a beautiful statement over here from conformal field theory that tells you that if the currents are not conserved to this small amount, the dimension 
also differs from S plus 1 by a small amount. And this is a crucial statement actually. Okay. So, I hope you are all with me that uh, if the current is conserved, not conserved by a small amount proportional to 1 upon k or effectively 1 upon n, then the dimensions of these currents are also s plus 1 plus order 1 upon n. That's quite fantastic, you see. But I didn't tell you which matter theory I'm working with. It's true for uh, any matter theory. So this is the formulation which I like best in terms of current algebra, that you have a statement in terms of currents which is sort of quite independent except for these uh, numbers over here and the sprinkling of derivatives. Uh, the uh, statement is very simple. Divergence is proportional to 1 upon k times jj plus you can have other terms in the bosonic theory which is 1 upon k square jjj j, j, for reasons I will explain. So, sorry, just yes. to understand, uh, you derived this equation for the fermionic case, I guess. Yes, uh, but for the bosonic case also you can do. Just on general grounds you are saying you could write Yes, this, which uh, I will now discuss actually, that's right. So, uh, yeah. Now, before that I wanted to say one more thing actually that uh, <coughs> I am only interested in this problem. Uh, the Hilbert space at large is characterized entirely in terms of these current operators which are simply bilocal in the fermion fields. And the reason is because, because if you have a double trace operator it simply factorizes the limit of large n. So the single trace operators or operators like the ones that we have been consider considering currents uh, form a set of primary fields. These fields and their descendants characterize the full Hilbert space of our theory at large n. And this Hilbert space does not seem to care what the matter content is, fermion, boson, supersymmetric, whatever. And these statements are completely true for any type of theory actually. And this algebraic structure which I have talked about over here, I will now show is also true by and large for any matter theory actually. Okay. Yes. But, but the free theory you have. You don't know all this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. On the theory, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, even four times so like any high times so I have on the first, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm saying uh, so the, this statement is only true after you introduce the gauge field. That is only true in the three dimensions. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I have nothing to say about uh, about four dimensions. In fact, frankly, I haven't talked about. It. But it's true what you said that for three fields. But I don't know what to do. Because you know there the theory is much more complicated. You have an F square term also. So I, I don't know. And it's far from soluble also, whereas these are. Okay. Now I claim, and this is what I want to uh, uh, argue with you. I will remove this now, that So this is the general statement I am going to make that convergence of the higher spin current is always equal to 1 upon k times a structure like jj with lots of derivatives sprinkled in between, you know, this, this is jj but there are sprinkling of derivatives, okay. 
which depend upon the details plus 1 upon k square j j j so these are double trace operators these are triple trace operators and why is this type of equation true actually in general i will like to now motivate so uh, i said that the currents all these currents which we are talking about have dimensions which are s plus 1 plus order 1 upon n okay it's quite amazing that the spectrum is the same whatever the matter is and uh, <coughs> If you look at the divergence of this object, then its delta will be s plus 1 plus 1 uh, plus order 1 upon n. That is basically uh, s plus 2. And uh, the spin okay, of this object will be s minus 1. You know, because you have contracted one index actually. So, if you compute over here tau of this fellow, uh, that turns out to be 3 plus small corrections. Now, there is uh, some amount of conformal field theory involved in actually proving that this is really true, which I won't go into. Okay, so, this is, uh, this is uh, in many, many pages in our paper but in a very beautiful appendix in Maldasina's Iboidia's paper. Where they have proved in a very nice way that uh, this is indeed true. And why is this equation there? Why is there no 4J term now? Clearly, it's obvious actually. Because uh, <coughs> if you compute the tau over here, it will be greater than or equal to 2, right? Because tau is 1 for here. And here, tau will be greater than or equal to 3. And if you had a 4j term, it will be greater or equal to 4, not allowed by the left hand side. So, this is the general structure of the theory of weakly broken symmetries by double trace operators, in, at least in theories of vector matter. If you had matter in the adjoint representation, the, the world is very different. You learn explicit symmetry breaking term, which is different. That's complicated, different stuff. Other question? So, uh, yeah. two questions yeah. actually. First of all, why did it take many, many? pages for us, given that it's such a simple argument the way you are saying. Oh, it's because when you do something for the first time. Maldasena did it afterwards. So it's uh, an important point, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, secondly, okay. And of course it's Maldasena. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and secondly, what, so why is it that I join matter then becomes different? Yeah, because if you, if you, if you carry out this type of exercise, for a joint matter, for firstly the, uh, the factorization will not work. <coughs> so you, you, the starting point is not obvious, and you expect in general also that uh, there will be other terms in different types of theories which will have explicit symmetry breaking. See, this this is not explicit symmetry breaking in the sense of not proportional to J. Okay, so this is the the encapsulation of content of our type of theories which are vector matter conformally invariant than Simon's theory actually. Okay. Hmm? Sorry, yeah. but just in very yeah. simple uh, minded way, yes. is it that the double trace can become a single trace with uh, exactly. the joint indices? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, that's right. Okay. Now, of course, uh, just one uh, caution that uh, you cannot just simply set k to infinity over here, okay? and say that divergence of j is equal to 0, you have to consider the correlation functions and then normalize the correlation function in such a way that you will see that in fact, if you compute for example, divergence of j, 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 so that will turn out to be something like uh, 1 upon j, 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 j. So, you use factorization and you get uh, j, 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 j plus or the n. So, I mean you can this is not, so uh, I'm sorry. This, uh, let me just put n over here, okay, scaled. So, these are normalized to n, each of them. 
So, this object goes as n. So, you have to be very careful when you talk about higher spin symmetry. Uh, all statements are within correlation functions. Okay. Uh, so, this is nice. So, in, this is the important summary over here and a statement that whatever the matter is, the spectrum of the theory, the spectrum of the theory, boson, fermion, supersymmetric, whatever you like, is given essentially by this plus This is the statement that actually prompted one of the statements that prompted the observation in our original paper that there may be a fermion boson duality. This and the connection to Vasiliev later. Okay. So, this, this blackboard summarizes that. The, the uh, partial conservation of higher spin current and the statement of the spectrum to leading order in 1 upon n. Okay. So, now I want to uh, go to the uh, discussion of the computation of the three point correlation function of these theories, uh, which is basically the work of uh, Maldasena and Zibodiev actually, and uh, how it sharpens the uh, duality. Uh, how we arrive at fermion, boson, and rank level duality. Uh, okay. So, let me just do that. Okay. So, uh, Maldasena and Zibodiev in a rather seminal paper, in my opinion, in this subject, uh, which I encourage everybody to read, uh, did the following. They asked themselves the question that given this type of structure of the non conservation by double trace operators, given this and a few other assumptions which I will tell you. What can you say about the three point function? And uh, they calculated it exactly in large n limit. So, I will now show you that. So, what are the assumptions? The first assumption is <coughs> that there is a parameter n bar in the theory n twiddle such that 1 upon n twiddle goes to 0 and the theory is weakly coupled. There is also another parameter called lambda twiddle, which parameterizes the many various theories. And you will see later on, I will show you that uh, this n twiddle and lambda twiddle are really related to the n and the lambda of our Chern Simons matter theories in some nonlinear way. Okay? But let us now just do this. The uh, second thing they assume is that the twist is equal to 1 plus order 1 upon n. All this we have seen in our explicit model. Okay, We have seen it already. This is after that. Uh, number 3 is the current conservation of non-conservation by small effects, but the small effects are such that there is a double trace operator over here double trace. Okay. In particular, they analyze the equation for the spin 4 current. Then uh, number 4 is there exists a unique energy momentum tensor mu 1, mu 2, uh, which is conserved and it is unique. Number 5 is, uh, now this is also interesting, that there exists <coughs> a spin 0 state which has either delta equal to 1 
or delta equal to 2 and nothing else. So, for example, if you are looking at the theory of fermions, then delta equal to 2 is classically true, but in the theory of bosons, it is only true in the infrared near the Wilson Fisher critical point because bosons will naively fall over here, stuff like that. So, anyway, this is an assumption. Number 6 is uh, in their paper, they have worked with real psi <coughs> and real phi. That is the gauge group is ON. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, this is uh, Majorana fermions and uh, <coughs> the gauge group is real. In these gauge theories over here, the spins are only even. And whatever they have proved, they have proved for even spins, which then is also valid for complex matter, as far as even spins are concerned. For odd spins, nobody has doubt as yet. Okay, so okay, so given these assumptions, what have they proved? So I will of course not go through the proof, but I will indicate what the idea is. They have basically used this equation of ours for the spin 4 current, which is written as, uh, you know, if you follow this, it's just this one plus j0, j0, j0 plus j2, j0, j0. And what they did is they derived a set of ward identities using these assumptions to constrain the coefficients of the three point function. So, this is what they did actually. They took what we did very seriously and applied it to derive a specific and important result. I will simply write down the result now for you j of S1, j of S2, j of S3 is equal to n twiddle times lambda twiddle square upon 1 plus lambda twiddle square times j s 1, j s 2, j s 3 boson. So, if you take the real free boson theory and compute j s 1, s 2, s 3 which you can do, this is the formula, this is the space time dependence. Okay. The next one is 1 upon 1 plus lambda twiddle square j s 1, j s 2, j s 3 for fermion. Again, take free fermions, last phase fermion, compute this, you get a formula, this is what it is. And of course, the surprising and interesting point was this one, there is one term that comes, that never comes out of free field theory and uh, it is what is called the odd term. This is a parity violating term, it has epsilons, this does not and it comes from free theories. So, this is the result of uh, Malda's If I uh, will now uh, extract uh, the physics from here, what, what, what this equation means actually. So, the first thing you recognize is that in the limit, when uh, lambda goes to 0, in the limit when uh, lambda goes to 0, uh, only uh, lambda goes to 0, this goes away, only this survives. In the limit when lambda goes to infinity, lambda twiddle, uh, only this survives. So, already you are getting a clue of what is coming. So, if you take n twiddle to n twiddle and lambda twiddle to its reciprocal, this three point function is invariant under that 
and these two terms are just interchanged. Okay, so this is the first explicit hint of fermion boson symmetry. This coefficient simply goes over to this one if you make this lambda going to 1 upon lambda. Sorry, oh, I am mean, so sorry. This, of course, remains the same and these interchange. Yeah. So, that is a small observation. Uh, then, further, a Harvard collaborator sat down and evaluated these correlators exactly for some special cases. And they found another set of very interesting equations is that they found that n twiddle is actually equal to twice n sine of pi lambda upon pi lambda and uh, lambda twiddle is equal to tangent hyperbolic of pi lambda upon 2. And in this definition of lambda is between 0 and 1. I remind you that lambda is equal to n upon k. So, you take some explicit calculations in these uh, well defined uh, vector matter plus John Simon's theories, you compute and uh, you can actually compute these coefficients there and now make this identification. So, the n and lambda or the n and k of John Simon's matter theories is related to n twiddle and n lambda twiddle by these nonlinear formulas. What is interesting here is the following that this simple transformation actually becomes n goes to k minus n and uh, k goes to, in fact, uh, very precisely it is this one. Okay, this is just algebra, you can work it out. This is a statement of level rank duality of John Simon's theory. All right. So, the exact calculation of Maldacena and Zeboidiev of the correlation function use these general ideas of uh, the way the currents are not conserved and a few other assumptions leads to a very beautiful duality between bosonic and fermionic type of matter theory, which translates into the level rank duality of the John Simon's theory. So, this uh, I mean of, of course, I mean all this is not mentioned in all the papers, but uh, this is the description of uh, what went on. So, uh, I think uh, I will stop now, because uh, this is a good uh, place to break. Oh, no, 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 no. I won't stop now. Sorry, sorry. I have to say something. I have five minutes. Okay. And basically, I have said what I wanted to say, but uh, this is very uh, impressive. Uh, things. So, um, you have a question? Is that duality only existed in supersymmetric series or just for chance I would say? Oh, I think it's uh, it's true in uh, any theory of matter. I'll show you tomorrow. In uh, I'll show you tomorrow how it actually all comes about. It's uh, it's nothing to do with the type of matter. It is. Uh, you don't understand it very deeply. I'll come to it tomorrow. It has something to do with the transformation properties of uh, uh, bits and loops. Uh, <laughs> in terms of the, of how the characters of various representations are structured. So, some math formulas are there, which uh, I, I don't, many other folks don't understand. We'll come to it tomorrow. Okay. Good question. Okay, so. Oh, yes. So, uh, so, um, so this is some function of space time, right? Because this is some function of space time. This one expects. So 
this functional space time can be calculated essentially by looking at three bosons. This by looking at three fermions. There's a third structure that arises. Now, how do you find this? Now, there was before this work, there was a paper by uh, Giombi, uh, Shiroban, and uh, Shi In, which actually studied the uh, various possibilities. Consistent with conformal invariance okay, of the three point function. And they had actually come up with these three possibilities. They only didn't know how to compute these coefficients. So, this is the so called odd term. It is some function of uh, space time points x1, x2, x3, which is consistent with conformal invariance, but is parity violating because it has epsilon symbols in it. And it cannot come out of free field theory. It has to it reflects the fact that there is an interacting theory there. Okay, so, what I want to say now is that uh, in some sense what I have described is that there are four ways of looking at the same theory in some sense. One is uh, you can talk about uh, Mark Lewis, uh, coupled to Chern Simons. So, let me uh, erase this. So, you can have let us say N s massless fermions coupled to let us say uh, O n s consignments. I am using the orthogonal group because the, the uh, matter content over here was real in this thesis work. The second description is in terms of uh, NF massless, uh, I'm sorry, bosons, fermions coupled to O NF consignments. The third one is the more abstract description in terms of currents. where higher spin symmetry is weakly broken by double trace triple trace operators. And number four, it is something which uh, in a sense started this whole game is Vasiliev theory. So, uh, So, in uh, one minute, what is Vasiliev theory? So, these theories uh, in 2 plus 1 dimension uh, are dual to a higher spin gauge theory in ADS 4, okay, not flat space time ADS. This was the discovery of Vasiliev, is a consistent higher spin uh, massless gauge theory exists uh, in ADS 4. And uh, <coughs> there were two types of theories actually, which Vasiliev discovered, A type and B type. In a sense, the A type theories uh, map onto our bosonic type of uh, dual theories. The B type theories map onto the fermionic. But he also talked about a line over here parameterized by E to the i theta upon 2 where theta takes values from 0 to uh, pi upon 2, I am sorry to pi. So, this theory is uh, A and B theories are parity preserving. This line over here, the theta goes between 0 and pi, not equal to 0 and pi are parity violating theories. And so, a natural guess that we had in our paper was that 
this flow from boson to fermion uh, is reflected in the uh, in the boundary theory, especially given the fact that the spectrum of the fermion and boson theory is the same. So, this was essentially the key uh, the beginning of this fermion boson duality, which was then uh, made extremely precise by uh, Maldacena and Ziboidier. And uh, given this very beautiful uh, new uh, interpretation by the work of Aharoni and company, this symmetry is nothing but the level rank duality of Chern Simon. So, these are the four things which I descriptions which I so nice unification here. Okay, thank you. I think I have finished exactly in one hour. Uh, questions, please. Uh, please. The zero modes of the currents that you have described, all the currents, high spin currents, will they correspond to some Noether charges? Yeah, of course. Uh, will yeah. there be obvious noether charges or something? No, 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 no. Just uh, you do the standard thing, and they all satisfy uh, infinite dimensional algebra. And will will there be a difference between truncating these spins to some certain value or taking it to inf infinity and qualitative difference? Ah, that I don't know. That, that that I don't know. I mean, how how this structure will change if I truncate the spins? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if anybody else knows the answer, I don't know this question. <laughs> Modulo these uh, things are satisfied, those uh, assumptions. Yeah. Huh. Yes, Modulo those assumptions. If you have uh, spin 3, you will have all of them. But those assumptions are important, actually. And uh, they may change. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, you, uh, the three point uh, correlation function comes as like a one over k square correction. Yes. But uh, in this one, you, it goes like uh, in total. So, uh, does it come like a one over k correction? Um, so, it's actually by k, I meant. What you do is you multiply and divide by n. This is fixed. This is fixed. And then n twiddle is related to n. Thank you. How did you care about the reversive? Sorry? Reversive. How did you care about ah. reversive? <laughs> very good, very good. So you see the the this is where the hidden assumption was. So, uh, I said that the, our lambda is between 0 and 1, which means that k is always determined with respect to n in our calculations, in the way we have defined John Simon's scale, all of us who have worked on it. Now, why is that true? The reason it is true is the following, that uh, one way of calculating, uh, you know, the ultraviolet properties of uh, John Simon's theory is by adding the Maxwell term, right? You can add the Maxwell term to the theory, to regularize the theory. This gives you a definition of uh, k, okay? So that is uh, the k angles definition, okay? Now, it's a fact proved by many people that one look can show that k hours, which I call small k, is equal to this plus this. Okay. So now you can you can divide. Actually, you can now talk about our lambda, which is uh, n upon k, which is equal to uh, n upon k and mills plus n, right? So if you take out uh, this fellow. So you have lambda yang mills divided by 1 plus lambda yang mills. Okay. And lambda yang mills can go from 0 to infinity. Immediately you see that the, the lambda that we use, V 
he who did computations using three minus one dimensional dimensional regularization. Our land, our lambda actually uh, goes between zero and one. This is a very important fact, very important point, and I will be using it very crucially uh, tomorrow when we discuss uh, John Simon's theory on H2 process. Thank you. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, now let's thanks, Ben. Yeah? Okay. Thank you.